In this episode of The Model Guy, I am going to be building Tamiya's fabulous F16CJ. It's a kit that doesn't need an introduction, build videos are a dime a dozen, and there's really nothing you can fault with this kit. I decided to add some aftermarket goodies from Edward, but I did run into some issues that I will let you know about further into the video. So sit back, get ready to sniff some glue, and let's get started. The F-16 Fighting Falcon was designed by General Dynamics as an answer to the U.S. Air Force looking for a low-cost, lightweight fighter. Having been in service for over 40 years now, the F-16 is well-rounded out as a multi-role aircraft, including the SEED missions, also known as Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses. SEED missions were developed and refined during the Vietnam War by the United States. This was in response to North Vietnam having their air defenses bolstered by Russian equipment who at the time were producing some of the best surface-to-air missiles in the world. Also known initially as Wild Weasel missions, their objective was to neutralize enemy radar sites before a strike package hit their targets. The Wild Weasels would either try to lock onto the enemy radar stations on the ground while they were active with a harm or high-speed anti-radiation missile, or simply have the radar stations shut down knowing that the weasels were looking for them. It's almost identical to playing flashlight tag as a kid, while the enemy on the ground would be using their beams of light to search for the inbound aircraft, the inbound aircraft, aka the weasels, would be looking for the sources of those light beams to lock onto. If those radar stations were online for more than a few seconds, the weasels were able to lock onto them even after they shut down and destroy the target. Although the technology involved has become more advanced since Vietnam, the basics have stayed the same, and that's where aircraft like the F-16CJ come into play. Whereas before in the F-4 Phantom you'd require two aircraft to complete a seed mission, where one Phantom would tease the ground defenses while the other one would look for the radar sources, the F-16CJ is able to do it with one airframe. The unofficial motto of the Wild Weasel Cruise is YGBSM, which stands for You've Gotta Be Shitting Me. As the story goes, this was the response of one of the electronic warfare officers when they found out that their goal was basically to make themselves a target for surface-to-air missiles. If you're looking for a good read on what modern combat looks like for the fighters in the F-16, I highly recommend Dan Hampton's book Viper Pilot, which is a memoir of his time during Operation Iraqi Freedom flying the 16. Lieutenant Colonel Hampton flew 151 combat missions and was responsible for the destruction of 21 SAM sites. Now let's talk about the kit. The Tamiya F-16 is probably one of the best model kits in 148 that you can get a hold of. However, there are some challenges with the build and a few of those with this kit I kind of put on myself. This kit has been in my stash for over two years and it was kind of a graduation present to myself for finishing my second year of trade training. Yeah, I know second year is not a big thing. However, I had a little bit of money to spare and I decided to buy a kit I normally wouldn't as jets usually aren't my forte with model building. And this kit usually runs around $70 to $80 in Canada. But I was able to pick one up for $40 and spent another couple dollars on the Big Ed set for it and the Big Sin set. I'll let you do the math and I ended up using maybe about 40% of the items in both of those kits. But you'll see why here in a few minutes. Although the Tamiya cockpit does look really nice, there's a lot of good detail, behind the ejection seat there's really not much going on. And if you look at pictures of the Viper in real life, there's quite a lot going on back here with hydraulics, sensors, electronics, harnesses, all kinds of fun stuff that you can get in there and scratch build. While I didn't try to copy every harness and wire there was behind the seat, I tried to make the best to simulate the busyness rather than replicate it. One of the factors that also caused this was Plasma released his FA-18E video of him scratch building gear base, and I thought to myself, that's something I'm probably capable of doing and I should probably try it. So for making the wires, I just stretched some sprue, used some lead wire, some copper wire, and other bits and pieces I had laying around the bench. Tamiya uses the same molds for their F-16A kits as well, so I had to use the photo etch parts from the Big Ed set to correct the cockpit. Usually I don't like replacing 3D parts with 2D parts, but because there's a couple extra screens in the cockpit, I had no choice to do a proper CJ. The engine is also incorrect on this kit if you're doing a Block 50 or Block 52 CJ, but for some weird reason the Edward resin had shrunk and didn't fit the kit. So that was something I wasn't able to use, but that's getting ahead of myself. One of the reasons that the F-16 is such an awesome aircraft is it featured quite a few new systems on board it that made it quite the advanced fighter for its day. Two of the biggest ones being the first 
fighter aircraft to have fly-by-wire systems where there's no control cables or anything like that. Everything is digitally input by the pilots, inputs to the stick, to the systems of the aircraft. And then the computer decides if the plane should do it or not. And the second being the hands-on stick and throttle system, which is basically also known as HOTAS, which means that the pilot does not have to take his hands off the stick and the throttle while he's flying the aircraft, especially in a combat situation. This means that rather than keeping his head down and trying to find buttons and switches in the cockpit, he can keep his head up and stay in the dogfight. This became a must-have on later aircraft. Not only was the F-16 the first aircraft able to pull twice its own weight in payload, it was also the first aircraft to be able to break Mach 2 and sustain a 9G turn. One of the coolest things I've ever seen in person at an air show was in Shearwater when an F-16 sustained a 9G turn, or so they told us on the ground, and completed a 360 degree turn within a 900 foot circle. That's pretty impressive when you think of how fast that jet is going. One area you may have problems in when you're building this kit by Tamiya is that the fuselage halves don't line up 100%. You'll end up with a little bit of a step if you're not careful. What I did was remove the locating tabs on the rear half of the fuselage because what was happening was the front half was pushing it down slightly. So I just cut them off and did a butt joint and that pretty much solved any issues. There was no sanding or filling that had to be done at all. Another challenging area is doing the suck hole on this jet because the seams on the side and then the rear section where the second half joins can be difficult to get at. And being a jet that has to be a very clean blended look in here so it's definitely a challenge compared to the warbirds just know depending on how clean you want that to look be prepared to spend some time here with different grits of sandpaper even though i'd spent money on the big ed set for the wheel bays i didn't like the look of the 2d parts it looked too fake so i ended up using some lead wire and again styrene and copper wire whatever i could find just to build up the hydraulics and the harnesses in the wheel bays I wasn't looking to be 100% accurate, I just wanted to replicate how busy this area of the jet actually is. There are aftermarket companies that make wheel bay sets for this aircraft for resin, but for a few dollars of lead wire, copper wire, and your time, you can do just as good a job with the kit. The only downer with having done all this work is once the jet's sitting on its wheels, you don't really see any of it. Now while I'm finishing up the wheel base, why don't you leave a comment in the comment section below and let me know what was something you did on a model that may have been a waste of time you felt, or something that after you put all the time into it, even if it wasn't visible, you still enjoyed knowing it was there. Let me know in the comments below and let's generate some discussion. For brake lines, I decided to use some stretched sprue. The only problem here is if you're not careful and you use a little bit too much glue, it'll melt that wire and you're left with a mess that... It has to be cleaned up and you have to start again, so just be sure that you're being very careful and using the minimal amount of glue needed. Ask me how I know. One of the things I found challenging about building this Tamiya Viper is the fact that I wasn't entirely sure when to paint the wheel bays. I decided to try to paint them before doing the rest of the aircraft. The only problem was trying to seal off the base from any overspray and stuff like that. And for the most part, it worked, but I did have to come in at the end and kind of touch it all up and repaint it. So that kind of has me wondering, did I waste some time? And maybe I should have just done it after all the major painting was finished. While I'm adding the photo etched stiffeners to the rear of the aircraft, one of the things I want to do is give a shout out to the Plastic Posse podcast. I've started listening to those guys about three, four weeks ago, and now on episode 14. And if you're looking for something to listen to while you're at the bench that's actually constructive and is very entertaining, you have to give these guys a listen. They bring in some guests from all different genres of the model world, and I've already learned quite a bit listening to some of those guys talk, and it's interesting just to hear their approach to some of the ways they build models. It's something I wanted to give them a shout out for. They're not paying for this or anything, but if that's something that interests you, definitely check it out because it's definitely worth the time. One thing I had to do with this Tamiya kit to build a proper Block 50 Viper in a little more modern version was to update the ECM pod that's on the bottom of the kit. The kit comes with, with what's called the ANALQ-184 ECM pod, but the Viper's been using a different style pod now for a while, so I had to use a resin version again from Edward, and this one hadn't shrunk, and this is the AN-ALQ-131 jammer. And the whole point of this is to basically shut down enemy radar and keep it from trying to track the inbound aircraft. 
One thing I wanted to do with this F-16 model is to definitely have a more worn slash weathered look for the jet. If you ever see these line aircraft close up, most of the time they're not beat so badly they look like they shouldn't be flying, but they're not in pristine condition. And anyone who tells you the whole story of no crew chief would ever let an aircraft be this dirty is basically lying. There's never been around a jet in their life that sees regular flight. Even airliners are pretty dirty when you get up close. Now with this kit and paint job, I wanted to bring forward the black basing style that I used with my World War II aircraft. I wanted to have this jet look kind of like 50 to 60% weathered, if that makes sense. So a lot of pre-shading, marbling, and different coats went on just to change the dynamic of that gray paint. It can be a very boring color to work with, but if you do a little bit of shading and play with it a little bit, you can make it a lot more interesting. The nice thing about this style of painting is you can really control how it looks by pushing it back or bringing it forward. The more filter layers you add, the more the weathering effect is going to be reduced because you're going to be blending those different tones underneath together. If you only add a few layers, then you're going to have a very worn aircraft. So it's definitely something you can play with and get different levels. I definitely found it easier to come in after the main painting and mask off the base. So that's probably the approach I'll do next time. As for these decals, they're an older set, so I had to be very careful to avoid any silvering that I may run into. I know a few of you may be screaming at the screen right now to put on a gloss coat, but if you've watched my builds, gloss coating's not something I do before decals. There's really no evidence that supports that it prevents deckling, and there are some videos out there that show people putting decals on sandpaper, if you've seen that one, that pretty much dispel any theory that gloss coating is necessary. What I did was use some Mr. Mark Setter and Mr. Mark Softer prior to the decal going down and afterwards, and for the most part, they went on really clean. The only issue I had was trying to get the carrier film down. And like any Tamiya decal, all I did was hit the model with two gloss coats after the decals were down and then came in with some sandpaper to remove that carrier film. I covered that process a little more in detail in my Sky Raider build, if you want to check that out. For the metal colors on the engine, I used Mr. Metal Colors because you're able to polish those afterwards and by buffing them a little bit, you give them a lot more shine which is always nice because that gives you a nice contrast to the flat paint of a military aircraft. For the ECM pod, I hit it with two vastly different color shades of green and just kind of blended them together until I had the worn look I was looking for. Look I was looking for, that's weird. And then afterwards, just hit them with some green oils just to kind of make it look weathered. Unfortunately, it's hard to get that kind of detail and have the camera under your nose, so I didn't film it. I'm definitely starting to get a little more confident using oils. And here you can see me dirtying up the business end of the jet by just blending the oils out a little bit and even creating my own washes here in the, in the wheelbase. I find making my own wash from oils compared to the Tamiya pre-made washes is you can really control the density a lot more and they seem to flow a lot better over flat paint. And for the most part, they're easier to clean up than Tamiya. I decided to add a little bit more weathering to the inspection panels on the Viper because looking at reference photos, that's an area that generally sees a lot of wear and tear. And it's hard to find a picture of a Viper that doesn't have that wear. I know a lot of guys like to appreciate that to get the effect, but I decided to try oils to see what I could do. One of the things that kept me from building this F-16 for so long is that I felt a little bit of pressure because I had so much money invested into the aftermarket parts for it. Now I know it's only money and it's kind of arrogant to say that, but at the same time, I didn't want to ruin the model or screw it up and feel like I'd wasted it. So I kept pushing this down the line further back, further back, further back. And then one day decided that, you know what, I should probably just go for this. Cause even if I do screw it up, the investment of that money is going to be worth more. Cause I'm going to come out of the build with some more skills and knowing what's going to work and what doesn't work. I don't really have any like uh, donor aircraft that I use for test building or effects or anything like that so at some point i should probably do that but at the end of the day i'm glad i went for this build because at the end of it it actually looks pretty nice at this point i've probably watched a few hours of youtube videos of how other people are working with oils everything from miniatures to cars just to see what different effects and different things they're doing that's going to bring this video to a close i hope you've enjoyed it hit like click subscribe if you haven't and if you'd like to see more behind the scenes check out my patreon page with these other fine people because you can support the channel for only a few dollars a month and you can get a lot more backstage access more high def photos more blog post style into what my mind is thinking and how i'm approaching different builds and whatnot 
I am the Model Guy. I hope you've enjoyed this build. It's definitely a little out of my wheelhouse, and I'll see you next time.